So welcome to the second part of this mini course on packing and covering. We'll talk about perfection. I'm going to show you that the study of perfect matrices reduces to the study of perfect graphs. And similarly, the study of perfect graphs reduces to the study of perfect matrices. So before I get started, I should tell you what a perfect graph is. So consider a graph G, and we're going to define a clique to be a complete subgraph. So a clique is a set of vertices which are pairwise adjacent. And a stable set is a set of vertices which are pairwise non-adjacent. Or equivalently, a stable set is a clique in the complement graph. Now, given any graph G, you can define two parameters. Omega G is the size of the maximum clique in G, so the size of the largest clique in G. And chi of G is going to be the chromatic number of G. So the chromatic number is a minimum number of colors in a coloring of a graph G. And what is a coloring of a graph G? It's a partition of the vertices of the graph into stable set, which we call colors. Equivalently, a coloring of a graph G is an assignment of colors to the vertices of the graph, such that adjacent vertices get assigned different colors. And the chromatic number is a minimum number of color in such a color. So there's a there's an easy relationship between those two parameters, namely omega of g is smaller than or equal to chi of g. And here's the first example. Uh, we have omega g, which is 3. You have three vertices which form a clique. And chi of g is 3. I give you a red, blue, and green coloring with three colors. Here's the second example. Here, Omega of G is 2, namely 2 vertices adjacent to an edge forms the largest possible clique, uh, but you actually need 3 colors to color uh, that uh, graph. This graph is called a 5 hole. The next definition we'll need is that of a, an induced subgraph. So if you give me a graph G, an induced subgraph of G is any graph I can obtain by removing vertices. And of course, all the edges which are incident to that vertex. Note that a graph is an induced subgraph of itself. So possibly you remove an empty subset of vertices. And now we're ready for the definition of a perfect graph. A graph is perfect if for all induced subgraphs, Omega is equal to chi of that induced subgraph. Right, so let's just look at an example here. Uh, this is an example of a perfect graph. Well, you may want to think of why is it perfect. You would have to check for every induced subgraph. And here's an example which is not perfect. Uh, namely, if you remove the vertex in the middle, right, you get an induced subgraph which is a five hole and that is not perfect because in that case, omega of that graph is two and chi of that graph is three. So this is a notion of perfect graph. So now I'm going to show you that the study of perfect matrices is contained in the study of perfect graphs. So here's a result which we already promised in the previous lecture, we want to show that if a 0, 1 matrix M is perfect, then the system Mx smaller than or equal to vector of all 1, x non-negative, is totally dual integral. And let me just remind you of what we mean by a matrix to be perfect. We mean that the following polytope is integral. All right, so 
let's just pick some non-negative uh, vector c, integer vector c, and we're going to define two optimization problem. P of c is just the relaxation of the set packing integer program, and d of c is going to be its do. Right, so the c index there refers to the objective function of the maximization problem and the right-hand side of the dual problem. And what we need to do is to show that d of c has an optimal integer solution. In other words, I can find an integer y bar which is optimal to d of c. Now, for those of you who remember the definition of total dual integrality I gave in a previous lecture, you might be wondering if I'm cheating here, because for the definition of total dual integrality, we had to look at every integer vector c, not just the non-negative one. So you should convince yourself that, in fact, in our case, we can restrict ourselves to the non-negative ones. And moreover, for non-negative c's, we are guaranteed to have an optimal value. All right, so let's just proceed by induction on the sum of the entries in our vector C. So our vector C is non-negative. If the sum of the entries is zero, then C is a zero vector, and then I can just pick the zero vector for my optimal dual solution, and I'm done. So this is my base case of my induction. Right, so this is where we are. P of C, D of C. And I need to show that d of c has an optimal integer solution. Okay, so let's just pick any optimal solution to d of c, right? So it doesn't have to be integer, but we have an optimal solution to d of c. And I'm going to construct a new vector y prime in the following way. Well, the first thing you should observe is that I can assume that y bar of 1 is strictly bigger than 0. Right, because y bar shouldn't be the zero vector, otherwise that'd be done. Uh, and now I'm going to define this vector y prime in the following way. So y prime and y bar will be the same on every component except the first component. And the first component of y prime will be obtained by taking the ceiling of the first component of y bar and then removing one. And now let me denote by A the first row of the matrix M. And I'm making the following claim. I'm claiming that Y prime is feasible for D of C minus A. So what is D of C minus A? Well, it's similar to D of C, except rather than having C on the right-hand side, now I have the vector C minus A. Now, why would that be the case? Well... Start with y bar. So whenever I take the ceiling of y bar of 1, I'm still going to remain feasible for d of c. I just made my variables larger, and I have a greater than equal to. And now, what happens if I remove 1? Right? So the first column of my problem d of c right, is at vector a. So when I remove 1 to the dual variable, I'm removing A to the left-hand side, but now I can also remove A to the right-hand side, so I go from C to C minus A, right? So Y prime is feasible for D of C minus A. And what is the value of the objective function for Y prime? So let's just compute it. So one transpose times Y prime, and then I just rearrange the terms here. So note that I've removed y bar 1, and I've added y bar of 1 to have a sum over all j's. And let's analyze this a little bit. That first expression in orange is always going to be strictly smaller than 0, and that is because y bar of 1 is strictly bigger than 0. And then that sum here is just z of w because y bar was an optimal solution to d of c. 
So this is strictly smaller than uh, Z of C. Right? So there's a typo here. It should be Z of C, not Z of W. All right, so this is the situation we have. We've constructed Y prime, which is a feasible solution for D of C minus A. And that function, uh, that solution evaluates to something which is strictly smaller than Z of C. So by weak duality, it tells me that the optimal value for D of C minus A is strictly smaller than the optimal value for D of C. In fact, because M is perfect, right, those objective values have to take integer values. So Z of C minus A is smaller than or equal to Z of C minus 1. And now we are ready to use induction. So we're going to use induction on C minus A, and we're going to deduce that there exists an optimal solution Y hat, which is integer, to D of C minus A. And now we can use that solution to get a solution to the original problem D of C. Namely, we just add one to the first component, right? So why is it an optimal solution to D of C? Well, you should convince yourself that it's feasible for D of C and its value is going to be one plus the value of Y bar, which was Z of C minus one. And that completes the proof. Next definition is that of a clique matrix. A 0, 1 matrix M is a clique matrix if its maximal rows are the set of all maximal cliques of some graph G. So let's just give an example. Here is a graph G with five vertices, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And we take a corresponding matrix M where the columns are indexed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and the maximal cliques of the graph correspond to the maximal rows of M. For instance, the set 1, 2, and 5 is a maximal clique of the graph, and it corresponds to a maximal row of M. Similarly, you can define the notion of a stable set matrix, where the maximal rows of that matrix should correspond to the maximal stable set of some graph G. So the next result we're going to show is that if a zero one matrix is perfect, then it must be the clique matrix of a graph. And I want to pause for a second to point out the significance of that result. It tells you that perfect matrices arise from graphs. Behind every perfect matrix, you have a graph that is hiding there. Right? We'll see that those graphs are exactly the perfect graphs uh, later on. All right, so a matrix is perfect, then it should be the clique matrix of a graph. Note that we could equivalently say that the matrix M must be the stable set matrix of a graph. Why? Well, because if M is a clique matrix of a graph, then it is also the stable set matrix of the complement graph. So those uh, two statements are equivalent, being the clique matrix of a graph or the stable set matrix of a graph. All right, so let's just try to prove that. So we are given that zero one uh, matrix uh, and we're going to construct a graph from that matrix. So the uh, vertices of the graph will correspond to the column of the matrix and uh, I and J will be adjacent in the graph if there exists a row, say A of my matrix, with a one in position I and a one in position J, right? And this will uh, uh, necessarily imply that the rows of the matrix will correspond to the cliques of the graph. Okay, so let's just look at a little example here. Uh, 
On the left, you have your 0, 1 matrix M. And uh, on the right, you have the graphs that you construct. So for instance, uh, if I look at the first row, I get a 1 in position 1 and 3. So 1 and 3 are adjacent to one another. You got a 1 between uh, position... Uh, uh, you got... For the first row still, you have 1s in position 1 and 4. So there's an edge 1, 4. And similarly, there's an edge 3, 4. So what do we need to show? We need to show that the maximal clicks corresponds to the uh, rows of M, right? So equivalently is that every click is contained in a row of M. So by the way, I'm using uh, zero one vectors as sets, right? So when I talk about a row of M, I really think of it as, since this is a zero one vector, as a subset of the ground set. Okay, so this is what we need to do. We need to show that for every click in the graph, I can find a row of M that contains that click. By the way, if you go back to the example that we had earlier, if you look at the click 1, 2, and 3, there's no row of M which has a 1 in position 1, 2, and 3. So in particular, that matrix M is not a clique matrix of a graph. All right, so this is what we need to show. We need to show that every clique is contained in some row of M. So, well, let's just proceed by contradiction. Suppose this is not true for some clique S. So there's some clique S that is not contained in some row of M. C be the characteristic vector of the clique S, and we define two optimization problem. IP is the set packing uh, problem, and P is going to be its LP relaxation. Now note that if some entry of C has value zero, then the corresponding variable will be set to zero in P or IP at optimality. So we can really restrict ourselves to the columns of the matrix M that correspond to the clique S. So what is IP doing? IP is looking for a maximum uh, stable set in our graph G. Well, how big a stable set can I find? Well, as I said, I can restrict myself to the clique S. And of course, I can't pick two vertices in the same clique. So ZIP is at most one. In fact, it's just one. Now, we're going to define X bar in the following way. So for every entry J, where J is not in my clique S, I set the variable, uh, variable to zero. And otherwise, I set it to one over the size of S minus one. And now what I claim is that, in fact, X bar is going to be feasible for P. So if I look at the left-hand side, how big a value can I get? Well, I can never have, I'm never going to take the sum of more than S minus one variable, size of S minus one variable, because otherwise I would have a row of M which is covering, uh, which is containing S. So this tells me that X bar is feasible for P, but what is the value of X bar in your objective function? Well, it's just size of S over size of S minus one, which is strictly bigger than one. And now we get a contradiction because ZP is supposed to be equal to ZIP since M is perfect. And that ends the proof. All right, so in the next result, now we're going to show that if a zero one matrix is perfect, then in fact, it has to be the stable set matrix of a perfect graph. All right, 
So a claim that we prove that M is a stable set matrix of G, that was a previous proposition, right? Remember that if you the clique matrix of a graph, you also the stable set matrix of a graph. So what we need to do is we need to show that that graph G has to be a perfect graph because the matrix M is perfect. So let's look at what happens when you take columns of matrices of M. So you should try to convince yourselves that columns of matrices of M are still going to be perfect. So perfection is closed under taking column sub matrices. And what, do, what does taking columns of matrices do in terms of the graph? So if you started with a graph which was the stable set matrix of some graph, when you take the columns of matrices, then you're really looking at the stable set matrices of induced subgraph. Right? So columns of matrices really translate into induced subgraph. And so that means that if I want to show that my graph G is perfect, all I have to do is just show that omega of G is chi of G, because if I want to show it for any induced subgraph, well, I use the fact that uh, I can take the corresponding column submatrix, and that corresponding column submatrix will still be perfect. So I can just reapply the same argument. Right? So all we're going to do is show that omega g, so the size of the largest clique of g, is equal to chi of g, which is the chromatic uh, number of the graph. Alright, so here we're going to write down first the set packing integer program. That's what I denote by IP. And then ID is what I get by taking the dual of the LP relaxation and throwing in integer condition. That's what I call ID. We've seen this pair of integer programs in the first lecture. So here's the first question. What is our integer program IP looking for? What does it find? So let's just write down our IP again. So we are maximized one transpose x and now I indicated my matrix M uh, so you have m times x smaller than or equal to the vector of all 1, then you have non-negativity, and x is integer. And the rows of a matrix will correspond to the characteristic vector of stable set. Now note that the variable will be set to 0 or 1. So the variable which I set to 1 corresponds to vertices that you're selecting. And each of the row corresponds to a stable set. So each constraint tells you that you can pick at most one vertex from each table set. So what you're really looking for are cliques. And in fact, you're looking for a largest possible clique. So you're looking for a maximum size clique. So omega g is equal to the optimal value of your integer program IP. Okay, so now let us look at what is ID uh, finding. So what is our second integer program finding? So let's just write down that integer program. So now you have a variable Y for every column of the matrix M uh, transpose. So for every row of the matrix M. And the column of your matrix M transpose correspond to the characteristic vectors of stable set. Now again, you can assume that those variable y we will either take value 0 or 1. So what you're looking for is for a set of stable sets. And what is the condition? The condition is that this should be greater than or equal to 1. So in other words, every vertex should be in one of the stable sets that you're selecting. So you're looking for stable sets that are covering the vertices, but stable sets, think of those as just being colors of your coloring, so you're looking for a minimum set of colors that is coloring your graph. So your integer program ID is just looking for chi of g. 
All right, so I'm summarizing here. I had a pair of integer program. The first one is finding omega g, the size of the largest clique. The second integer program is finding chi of g, the uh, chromatic number of the graph. And now what do we know? Well, we haven't used the fact that the matrix M is perfect, so we should use it now. So if the matrix M is perfect, it tells us that the system Mx smaller than or equal to 1x non-negative is totally dual integral. And that tells us that, in fact, those two integer programs, IP and ID, have the same value. But because they have the same value, in particular, it tells us that omega g is equal to chi of g, which is what we wanted to prove. So we've shown that if you give me a perfect matrix, then it has to be the stable set matrix of a perfect graph. So in particular, if you understand perfect graphs, you also understand perfect matrices. Uh, so is the converse true? In other words, if I understand perfect matrices, do I also understand perfect graphs? And then the answer is yes, and this is what we'll show uh, in the next section. So from perfect graphs to perfect matrices. So the first result we're going to prove is just really a result about uh, perfect graphs. So by duplicating a vertex V, we mean the following. Uh, you take your vertex V, you add a new vertex V bar, and you're joining V bar to all the neighbors of V and to V itself. So let's just look at an example here. On the left, this was my original graph. You had a vertex V, and I added a new vertex V bar, which is joined to the neighbors of V and to V. So why do we care about this operation? Well, we'll see that this operation preserves perfection. Now, it may seem a little weird. Why would we prove a result like this? Uh, so, we want to show in particular that whenever I have a perfect graph, I can construct a perfect matrix, and perfect matrix matrices uh, have an associated TDI system. The TDI system is a min-max relationship for arbitrary weights. Whereas the definition of perfect graph, you can think of it as a min-max relationship with weights zeros and one, where zero correspond to induced subgraph. So we need to be able to go from that min-max relationship with weight zero one to arbitrary weight, and this is where duplication comes in. But anyway, for now, you don't have to concern yourself with that. All we're going to do is to prove that duplication preserve perfection, and then later on, you'll see how it all fits together. All right, so this is the result. You take a graph G, I tell you that it's perfect, and then I take a graph H obtained from G by duplicating some vertex V, then I claim that the resulting graph is still going to be perfect. So I'm going to show you that uh, omega of H is chi of h. Now, that's not quite enough to show that a graph is perfect. I really have to show it for every induced subgraph. Uh, and in fact, the proof for the induced subgraph is going to be the same as doing the proof for the graph h itself, but it just, the notation sort of gets in the way a little bit. So I'm just going to leave that as an exercise. But there's nothing uh, of importance that is left out by not talking about induced subgraph. Okay, so G is your original graph, H is what you get by duplicating some vertex V, and you want to show that in that graph H, the size of the largest clique is equal to the uh, uh, chromatic number of the graph. Okay, so we start off with the graph G, and uh, the graph G is a perfect graph, so I can color it using omega G colors. And I'm going to give names to those different colors. So color one, uh, uh, the color class one is going to be called C1, C2, and so on. 
And I can assume that the vertex V, so that this is a special vertex that gets uh, duplicated in H, that vertex V is in the first color class. And now I'm going to do a case analysis based on whether that vertex V is in some maximum clique of G or not. So in the first case, V is in some maximum clique of G. All right, so what happens here? So when I add my vertex V bar, right, I'm joining my vertex V bar to V and every neighbor of V. So if I had a clique S and it contained V, I can add V bar to that clique and I get a larger clique now which is living in H. So in particular, it's telling me that omega of H is omega of G plus one. Now this is, this is good, right? Because I'm trying to color the graph with as many colors as the size of the largest clique. So now the size of the clique just went up. So I have one more color to play with. So how, how do I get my coloring? Well, I just pick the old color which I had and that color just my new vertex V bar with a brand new color. That's clearly going to give me a, a coloring of the graph. And uh, it's gonna have uh, omega H is equal to chi of H. Right, so this is sort of the easy case. If you click went up by one, you get one extra color, just color that, uh, use that extra color to color your vertex V bar. So the more complicated case is when your vertex V that gets duplicated in H is in no maximum clique of G. Right, so in that case, the size of the clique doesn't go up uh, in H. So I've drawn, I'm going to draw a little example so that you can follow the argument on that example. So you have the graph G. The graph G has, in this case, three color classes. Omega G is just three. You get a triangle and your three color classes are C1, which is the red vertices, C2, the blue one, and C3, the green one. And now I'm going to define a new graph G prime. So G prime is an induced subgraph. And what I do is I delete every vertex which is in the first color class except for V. Right? So in my tiny example, I have just two vertices uh, which are red, right? One of the two is my vertex V, so there's just one vertex which I remove. And now I look at an arbitrary maximum clique of G, right? So in my little example is this uh, little uh, uh, set of three vertices that induces a triangle. Um, and uh, if you look at what happens in this example, uh, that clique is grabbing one vertex from each of the color class. And I want to argue that this is always going to be the case. So let's just see that. Well, for every color class, my clique is going to pick at most one vertex from that color class. Why? Well, it's a clique and color classes are a stable set. So I can pick at most one vertex. But now, how many uh, 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 vertices do I have in my clique? I have omega of G. How many color classes do I have? I have omega of G. So I must be actually grabbing one color, uh, one vertex from each of the color class. Right? So in particular, I'm going to be grabbing one vertex of the clique in the color class C1, and that vertex won't be the vertex V, because V is not in any maximum clique of G. Now why do I care about that? Well, this is telling me that if I delete every vertex which is in C1 except for the vertex V, I'm going to delete a vertex from every maximum clique. So the maximum clique number will go down. So omega of G prime will be omega of G minus one. Right? And you can see that this is true in our little example. 
right? Omega of g prime is 2 and omega of g was 3. Now, why is that a good thing? Well, g prime is a perfect graph, so I can color it uh, using omega of g prime colors, right? So this is what I'm doing in my little example there. I get two colors. So in general, how many colors do I need? Well, I need omega of g minus one colors to color uh, my graph g prime. And now you're almost done, right? You can look at what happens in that little example put back the colors which are in the first color class, right? Well, except that in the first color class, I had V, which was in that color class there. Now I'm going to color V bar. But V and V bar play the same role, right? And what you get there? Well, you get a coloring of your original graph H. And how many colors are you using? Well, you're using omega G colors, which is omega of H color. So you've proved that omega of h is chi of h, which is what you want to do. So now I can use this result about duplication to show you the result I really care about, namely that if g is a perfect graph, uh, then you construct its stable matrix of g, so the rows of your matrix are just going to be the maximal stable set of the graph g, and then your matrix M, I claim, is going to be perfect. Okay, so let's just uh, define the four optimization problem we've seen uh, in the uh, first part of the course. So IP is just your set packing problem. P is the LP relaxation. D is a dual. And ID is a dual together with integrality condition. And then ZIP is the optimal value for IP and so on. And you have the following relationship between the uh, optimal value for each of those optimization problems. So what do I need to do? I need to show that for every C, which is a non-negative vector, ZP is integer. Right, so why is that? Well, I want to show that a polytope is integral, namely the polytope mx smaller than or equal to 1, x greater than or equal to 0. And if I want to show that a polytope is integral, all I have to do is to show that for every integer objective function, the optimal value that is attained for that objective function takes integer value. Right? This was one of the characterizations we used to prove integrality of polytopes. Now, again, if you take C that is has a negative entry, then the corresponding variable is going to be set to zero. So it suffices to look at C, which are non-negative. Right? So we pick C, non-negative vector, and then we will want to evaluate the optimal value we get for our linear program P, and we want to show that this is always an integer. And in a nutshell, the way we're going to do it is to say, well, ZP is sandwiched between ZIP and ZID. So all I have to do is to show you that ZIP and ZID, in fact, take the same value, and then we'll be done. Okay, so the key idea here is to construct a new graph, right? So you have C, that's uh, your non-negative uh, uh, integer vector, and you're going to construct a graph GC from G by doing the following for every vertex. So first of all, if you have a vertex where the corresponding uh, cost function is zero, then you just delete it. And otherwise, if it has value one, you don't do anything. And if it has value greater than or equal to two for a particular vertex V, then you're going to duplicate it C of V minus one time, right? So G of C is going to be some graph that depends on G and the non-negative uh, cost C that you've picked. All right, and now I claim that the object, uh, optimum value for the integer program IP is just going to be omega of G of C, in other words, the size of the largest clique 
in the graph obtained uh, from G by doing those duplication as I indicated in the previous uh, page. Alright, so now why would that be the case? Well, let's just look at our optimization problem IP. Right? So I have variables x for every vertex, they take a value 1 for 0, 1 if I choose a vertex 0. Otherwise, the rows of the matrix now correspond to stable sets of my graph. Uh, so what does it say? Well, it says I should not pick two vertices from the same uh, stable set. So what I'm looking for is a clique. And now if I look at the objective function, I have C transpose X. So I'm really looking for a maximum weight clique in C, where the weights are given by that vector C. All right, that's not quite what I want. I want to express this in terms of the largest size of the clique in GC. But I claim that those two things are the same, and I don't want to get into many details, but let's just illustrate what happens on the tiny example, because it will give you the right idea uh, for what happens in general. So suppose I look at a graph G, where the weights are all one, except for that vertex in the middle, which are the weight two. So what I would do to build up G of C is that I would replace that vertex in the middle, I would duplicate it once. I would replace it with two vertices. And now, if you look at the maximum weight clique of G, so it has a weight 4, right? 1 plus 1 plus 2, right? That gets transformed into a clique of size 4 in G of C, right? So duplication essentially allows you to change maximum weight clique into maximum cardinality clique in that graph uh, after duplication. Right? So that tells you that ZIP is the size of the largest uh, clique in GFC. All right, so now let's try to understand what ZID is computing. And I claim that it's computing chi of GFC. So again, let's write down what our integer uh, dual is doing here. Right, so now you have variables y. The variables y corresponds to stable sets. Um, and uh, uh, the columns of your matrix M transpose are the stable sets. And so what is it that you're trying to do? You're trying to select stable sets, possibly more than once, so that for every vertex V, you select that vertex uh, C of V times. Right? So I claim that, again, you can translate uh, that problem there into uh, just finding the uh, chromatic uh, number in the graph G of C. So uh, we look at an example G again. Uh, you have one vertex where you have a cost 2. Everybody else has a cost 1. So for G of C, you're just going to replace that one vertex with a cost 2 with uh, a pair of duplicated vertices. And uh, the stable set that you selected in your integer program ID, right, we're covering that special vertex with a weight 2 twice, namely it was in colored red and it was colored green, right, so each color class is a stable set. And you can see that this just gets translated into uh, a collection of stable sets uh, that covers every vertex exactly once. Uh, in other words, it's just looking for a coloring of G of C. Okay, so now let's just put those results together, right? We have that ZIP is just omega of G of C. And then we have that ZID is just chi of G of C, and we have the inequalities we had before just from LP duality and relaxation. And what do I know about G? Well, I know that G is perfect. So using the previous lemma, it tells me that G of C is perfect because it's obtained from G by repeatedly doing duplication. But because G of C is perfect, Omega of G of C is equal to chi of G of C. 
right? So everything has the same value, and that common value uh, is integer, and that's a value for uh, uh, that's that's a value that p as well, the optimal value for your integer program, uh, your linear program p. So that proves that the matrix M is perfect, right? So we've shown that if you give me a perfect graph, I can take the matrix, which is the stable set matrix of that perfect graph, and that matrix would be a perfect matrix. So if you understood perfect matrices, you would understand perfect graphs. So somehow, everything you need to know about perfect graphs, you know by looking at perfect matrices and vice versa. So to understand perfect matrices, you have to understand perfect graphs. Uh, and fortunately, we understand a lot about perfect graphs. In particular, there's a nice characterization of perfect graphs. So before I get to perfect graphs, I want to sort of look at how we would characterize minor closed classes of object. So what do we mean by minor closed class of object? Well, you're looking at some kind of containment operation. In the case of perfect graphs, it could be, uh, it is going to be induced subgraph, but it could be any other operation. But the property you want is that if you are in the class, after you apply that containment operation, you're still in the class. So one characterization would be to just describe what is inside that class of object. So this is what we refer to as structured theory. So I may tell you that you can construct every object in your class by maybe gluing or putting together some simpler objects that are well understood. There's another way of trying to characterize a, a minor class of objects. And this is to describe what is just outside that class. So what do we mean by what is just outside? Well, you get some kind of containment operation, right? So the property you want is that if you are in the class and you apply that containment operation, you remain in the class. So you could look at the objects which are just outside the class. You outside the class, but if you apply a containment operation, now you become inside the class. So this is what we call excluded minor theorems. And for perfect graph, you actually have both. There's a structure theorem. In other words, there's a theorem that tells you how to build every perfect graph from simple graphs. And there's an excluded minor theorem, which tells you what are the graphs which are just not a perfect graph. And I'm going to describe the second result because it's easier to describe, but the second result really is a consequence of the first result. Okay, so let's just get a little more concrete here. We're going to say that a graph is minimally imperfect if it's not perfect, but every proper induced subgraph is perfect. So what do we mean by proper? We mean that we're removing at least one vertex. Okay, so what are examples of minimally imperfect graph? Well, you have an odd hole. So you take a circuit of odd lengths that has no core, right? So those, the edges which I drew here are the only edges which appear in your, uh, in your graph. Say. And another example is what we called an odd and a hole, and it's just the complement of an odd hole. Uh, so a five hole, so an odd hole with five vertices, if you take its complement, it's going to be an odd uh, and a hole, but it's also going to be an odd hole. So to take the smallest odd and a hole, which is not an odd hole, you have to go to seven vertices. So it's easy and you should really uh, convince yourself that both odd holes and odd and a holes are not perfect graphs. And the amazing thing is, is that these are the only uh, obstruction. So those are the only minimally imperfect graphs, right? This was a, a conjecture of 
euh, Claude Berge. Now that this implies uh, the so-called perfect graph theorem, it, uh, which says that a graph is perfect if and only if uh, so is its complement. Now why is that? Well, because odd holes and odd anti holes are uh, complement of one another, right? So if in if you have a graph which is not perfect, then it contains an odd hole or an odd anti hole. So in its complement, it will also contain either an odd anti hole or an odd hole. So what about perfect matrices? Right? I just said that the study of perfect graphs is somehow equivalent to the study of perfect matrices. What's the corresponding result for perfect matrices? Well, we have to define what is a minimally imperfect matrix. So it's a matrix which is not perfect, but every proper column of matrix is perfect. Why are we looking at columns of matrices? Well, because removing a column is uh, corresponds to removing a vertex in the graph. And now you have a theorem that characterizes the minimally imperfect matrices. So what do you have? Well, you have click matrices of odd holes and you have click matrices of odd and a hole. Now by now you might be wondering, should I say click matrices? Or should I say stable set matrices? Somehow clique matrices sound a little better. And because the complement of a clique matrix is a stable set matrix, it's equivalent. So if you like it better, you can write down stable set matrices of odd holes or stable set matrices of anti holes. But there's a third one. What's the third one? Well, you have to make sure that your matrix is the clique matrix of a graph. And uh, so you need to have one more obstruction. So what is that obstruction? Well, you take any matrix and it has to contain a square submatrix on top, which is the matrix of all one minus the identity. So you get zero on the diagonal for the square matrix and ones everywhere else. If you have such a matrix, then you nod the clique matrix of a graph, and uh, if you don't contain such a matrix as a column sub matrix, then you are the clique matrix of a graph. All right, so you have a really nice characterization of minimally imperfect uh, matrices. And we'll see that uh, such characterization really remains elusive when we look at idealness or Mengerian property uh, in the next lecture.